everybody. Uh, special welcome to all our guests and visitors today as we celebrate Thanksgiving. There will be no service tomorrow. And once again, no service tomorrow. There is the giving table at the front of the church over here for all those who uh, brought a token of their Thanksgiving for the past year to share with the church family. Uh, place your item on the table up front and then following the service today, uh, you can take an item uh, and remember to continue to be with, uh, continue to be grateful to God and for the church family member who shared in their gratitude. Thank you uh, as well to all who helped out with the Thanksgiving food baskets. Uh, we had lots of uh, food donated and we had to buy very little, so that was awesome. Uh, your willingness to serve is greatly appreciated. Uh, next week's newsletter will have uh, information regarding the Samaritan's Purse uh, shoe boxes. Happy anniversary to Robin Arlene Renchma on October the 10th and to Aaron and Sherry McCutcheon on the 14th. Happy birthday on October 9th to Marcia Vermey and on the 11th to Albert Robus and on the 13th to Anita Betterly. Craft nights continue on Tuesdays at 7 uh, to prepare for the annual bazaar. Uh, for the, all the rest of the other news, uh, see today's newsletter for all the other announcements. And as well, pray for uh, our members of consistory that will be going uh, going to and uh, for the upcoming classes meeting as well on October the 28th. Thank you. Thanks, Wayne. To make sure that's on the record. There we go. Thank you, Wayne. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome this morning. Welcome to all those who are visiting with us and those who are tuning in online. Welcome. Uh, our call to worship this morning Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Let's, uh, let's all stand together um, and pray uh, and thank God for this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your presence here. We thank you, Lord, for all that we have to be thankful for and uh, for this time of thanksgiving. Father, we pray uh, and trust that you are here moving in our hearts, uh, stirring us to wonder, helping us, Lord, that we might have hearts that are full of thanksgiving. Uh, this we pray in your precious name. Amen. Let's turn to each other this morning and welcome each other here this morning. So we're not doing this one. Josie, you right? Good morning. Jay. I'm J uh, Jay from the, from the house. So I, was, I was chatting with you and Alan. Remember when you were doing our treat? Nice to see you. Good to see you. Good morning. Good morning. Sorry, I was going for the elbow there.
As our uh, time of confession this morning, we're going to continue to sing this, this song, Lord, I Need You, um, acknowledging that we need Him every moment of the day. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour, I need you.
seated. Children are welcome to come forward. Hello. Okay, all right. Uh, well, nice to see you. I'm glad we had two people from, from St. Catherine's. That's nice. Two little girls. And we have her all the time, which is nice. <laughs> anyway, my story today is a, is a little different. Uh, do you know what tomorrow will be? What day do we have tomorrow? Anybody know? Thanksgiving. And you know, on Thanksgiving, you always think that you have to say some special thanks because, well, it's, it's appropriate to say thank you on Thanksgiving Day. But I'd like to tell you a story from the Word of God where 10 people were cured and only one came back and said thank you. That's hard to believe, isn't it? But that's what happened. Now, when your mom and dad give you something, what do you say when you get it? What do you say when you get it? When you get something from your mom and dad? Thank you is always appropriate, right? So I want to tell you a story about uh, the Lord Jesus when he traveled from uh, the northern part of Israel to Jerusalem. And he went along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And then he came to a little village. 
And in this little village, he heard some voices in the distance. And they said, Lord Jesus, help us. Be merciful to us. So, and then when they came a little closer, he noticed they were lepers. People that have a lepers, they have a, lep a leprosy is a disease that they have. And they have all kinds of spots. And sometimes, even, took some pictures. They look like this, which is not very good, is it? And they also lose their, their fingers on their hands. And, and even sometimes something on, on their feet. And they may sometimes even use their ears. So that's not very good. He talked. OK, OK, OK. <laughs> I can't do both, yeah. So they, they lose both. So then when these people have this leprosy, they have to call out, you know, uh, that they, ha they have to call out something so that, pe that people stay away. Because if they don't, then they come too close and then those people get it too, which is not very good. Well, this time there were 10 lepers who called and said, Lord Jesus, have mercy on us. And what the Lord Jesus, when he saw them come closer, he said, go to the priest and, and he will check you. He didn't say all that, but that'll make it a little bit plain so you can understand. Why would you have to go to the priest? Well, the priest had to check whether those spots would be gone and if the fingers came back and what have you. And then they could join the rest of the society. Because now you know where they lived? They lived outside a village, outside a city, with all other kinds of people who had leprosy. They were all a leper colony. And that's how they lived. And they never saw their children much. They never saw their wife or their husband. It was terrible. So anyway, when they went on the way to, to the priest, they all of a sudden must have noticed the spots were gone, the fingers came back, the ears came back, sorry, the ears came back, and all, everything was back to normal. They were healthy. Don't you think if that happened to you, you would stop and think, maybe I should go back and say thank you? Of all those people, there was only one who looked at himself and thought, I should go back and tell the Lord Jesus, thank you. So he went back and he said, thank you, Lord. Thank you for healing me. And the Lord Jesus says, weren't there 10 people that I healed? Where are the other nine? He says, only one came back and thanked me. And he is not even an Israelite. He was a Samaritan, a person that the Israelites did not like very much. And he came back, and he fell at the Lord Jesus' feet, and the Lord Jesus said to him, your faith has made you whole, go and be blessed. So I thought that was quite something, to say thank you when something like that wonderful happened, and the Lord took care of you. And so tomorrow, when it's Thanksgiving, think of things that the Lord has done for you. I know you're a little small, but all the older ones can think of things that the Lord did and say a special thank you for what he has done for you. Thank you. And now we do a little prayer so that you can go to Sunday school. Heavenly Father, we have learned again how much we have to appreciate all the things you do for us. We pray that you will help us to show more and more thankfulness in our life and that we may treat other people at the way you would want us to treat them. And now, Lord, we be with these girls when they go to Sunday school, help them, and may they learn something wonderful again today. For we ask it all in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Come thou fount of every blessing To my heart to sing thy praise Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise 
1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 24. Be joyful always, pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything. Hold on to the good. Avoid every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Amen. Thank you, Lenny. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray um, as we have opened your word, as we have uh, listened to what you have to say to us, Father, we pray that this time that you would help us to understand deeper uh, the meaning of, of thanksgiving in, in our lives for the well-being of, of, uh, of others, but also of ourselves and all that we have to be thankful for. This we pray in your precious name. Amen. So give thanks in all circumstances. That's, that's our, um, if there's a key verse in what we just read, that's, that's our key verse for this morning. And I know tomorrow on the calendar is officially Thanksgiving, but, but that is what this holiday is about, right? It's a time of the year when we remember, um, when we reflect upon what it means to be thankful, right? when we think about and remember the importance of being thankful, of all that we have to be thankful for, but also the, 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 the need of responding with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, because it is good to be thankful, isn't it? It's good to be thankful. Obviously, it's good for others, right? When we say thank you to someone or when we show our, our gratitude to someone for, for, uh, for something that they've done or said. But it's also good for us to be thankful, to, to have this Thanksgiving in our heart. And so hopefully by the end... Um, of what we're looking at today, we're all going to see together how true that really is. How true that really is. How thankfulness really is an antidote or a, um, 
like a remedy to, to things like anger, bitterness, resentment, and, and the like. And how we can't be both thankful and angry or bitter or what have you at the same time. Isn't that true? Can't be both angry and bitter at the same time. We can be one or the other, but we can't be both. And so if we choose anger, we can't be thankful. And if we choose thankfulness, we can't be angry. Thus is the, the title for this, this morning uh, uh, sermon is a, a Thankful Heart Makes the Anger Depart. Neat little saying, but for me, it's just, uh, I, I'm going to share a little bit a, later uh, something I learned this week, and, and I, I need to come up with something like that so that I remember that saying and I remember what God taught me uh, through it all that it represents. But Paul... Um, he says in what we read there, he says to give thanks in all circumstances. And in a moment, we're going to look a little bit more at what that means um, on a fuller scale. But surely part of what that means, to give thanks in all circumstances, is to give thanks all the time. Right? Because circumstances are all the time. So therefore, Paul's encouraging us that we need to give thanks all the time. And so this holiday is not a day that we set apart to give thanks Right? As if all the other days of the year are just, you know, carte blanche for us to be able to just go nuts with all our ingratitude, right? Or uh, to express our, all that we're unthankful for. No, this is a day that we ought to uh, set apart to remind ourselves to be thankful. How important it is to be thankful and, and not to lose sight of all the things that we have in life. No matter what circumstance we find in, there's always something to be thankful for. All right, so let's jump in. So Paul, I invite you to follow along in your Bibles. Um, but Paul, in verse 16, he says, Rejoice always. And I just had to stop right there because if you're like me, you're thinking, you know, Paul, always? Rejoice always? You, you can't be serious, right? Paul, you must be exaggerating here to make a point. Surely, Paul what you meant to say was rejoice always when there is a reason to rejoice. Right? Rejoice always when there is a reason to rejoice. And I think that if I, I had Paul as an audience when I'm saying that, if I, somehow I could travel back in time, I think he would have been nodding at approval at what I just said to him and said to me then, yes, Jay, exactly. When there is a reason to rejoice, rejoice. But then while I was left there scratching my head trying to figure out, Paul, what are you getting at? Are you playing word games with me? I can imagine Paul smiling, putting his arm around me and saying, you know, and Jason, there is always a reason to rejoice. There's always a reason to rejoice. So rejoice always. But I'd still be wanting to object, right? And say to Paul, come on, Paul, but that's just not true, is it? It's just not true. There's not always a reason to rejoice. Like when someone is sick, falls sick from some debilitating, de debilitating disease. Paul, you, is that something to rejoice over? Or when someone has fallen from, from grace in some way, whether into adultery or maybe into a, an, an addiction or what have you, is that a time to rejoice? I don't think so. Or Paul, you know, think of if someone you loved passed away, surely you would not be rejoicing then. But again, I think Paul would have continued to nod in approval with each example that I raised. And maybe even as tears began to well in, up in his eyes as he remembered himself a close friend who was struggling with some debilitating illness. Or, or a marriage that he knew of that broke his heart that was on the rocks, or a brother or sister in the faith maybe who had just recently died from, from sharing the gospel. And then he'd say, of course there is a time to mourn. There is a time to grieve. There are times when sorrow is the most needed response. It is God, after all, he would say, who created us with tear ducts who created us with the ability to, to be able to cry in the first place. But Jason, he would say, in, in those moments, 
even in those dreadfully painful, dark moments, there is still hope. There is still hope. There is always, always hope, Jason. You see, sickness is allowed, yes, to speak for now, but it will not have the last word. It's not allowed that word. And sin and the myriad of ways that it can lure the best of us off the good path to where we fall from grace because Paul would say, we've all done it. We've all fallen from grace in our own way. But yes, sin, yes, it's allowed to speak for now, but it too will be denied that last and final word. And death, and death, Paul would say, thanks be to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, it too will be silenced in the end. Sickness, sin, and death, they will not have the final say. That word, Paul would say, that word belongs to God and to God alone. And continuing with the time traveling theme here, I was thinking if we could go back also to the island of Patmos, to where John was uh, in exile at the end of his life, the one who uh, had many visions and who wrote them down in, in the book, in his book of Revelations, visions of the end times. That is the time when sickness and sin and death come to an end, right? The gospel, uh, the good news of the end times of all that. John, too, would agree with Paul emphatically here. tell us he'd say yes sickness sin and even in death he'd say there there's hope there's reason to rejoice even then and then john would go on to share why and he'd say because i got a vision of what lies beyond death's door and it's recorded for us if we were to open up to revelation 21 it's recorded for us where he said i saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea, and no longer any sea. And it's important to know in the ancient world, the sea represented chaos. Uh, it, it represented uh, destruction. It represented um, inhabit it's inhabitable. You can't live there, right? The sea represented sin. And so the, when he's saying there's no longer any sea, what he's saying, there's no longer any of that. He'll go on to uh, say the same thing in, in a moment here. But then he goes on to say, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared uh, as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And then here's the no more sea. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. And so sickness and death and, and sin, what he's saying there is they're denied the, the last word. They're silenced in the end. And then John tells us, he goes on in the very next verse to tell us who that word belongs to. He says, he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new, everything new. That right there is the last word of the matter. All things will be made new. And so therefore we have reason to rejoice always. But even if we have come to see this as true, have come to believe in it more and more, how quickly we forget. Don't we? Are you with me? How quickly I forget. Right here, I, one of my favorite pictures is, is uh, Peter, you know, when he's walking on the, on the water, on the sea. In the ancient world, that, you know, yeah, it happened. He's walking on the sea, but they saw so much more, right? He's walking on the chaos. The chaos is untouched. And so, but we know the story. He forgot for a moment the reason that enabled him to remain standing even in the midst 
of the storm, right? To rejoice always. That reason, of course, being Jesus. For a moment, he took his eyes off and he saw only the waves surrounding him. And that was enough to bring him down. And for us, the waves of chaos that we experience in life, the waves of sickness and sin and death, these waves that can come one after another sometimes, just unrelent unrelenting, they can get, um, in fact, they will get the, the better of us at times. We too will take our eyes off of the reason to rejoice always. We'll take our eyes off of Jesus, where we will see only the waves in a, in a, of destruction in our life, the storm coming one after another, and where we too will begin to sink into the depths of, of despair. But just as Jesus was there to lift Peter up from that watery grave, so also does he promise to be there for each and every one of us in those moments. But yes, how quickly we forget and that there's reason to rejoice always. And, and Paul, knowing this, for, for, for us, he wrote, wrote it down, but surely he knew it for himself too. He's, he's, he's preaching to himself here. Knowing that we forget so easily, his very next words seem to address this, right? Because what does he say? He says, pray continually. Pray continually. And what he doesn't mean there is he doesn't mean pray every second of the day and, and every moment of the night, right? That's impossible. Um, that's not what he means by continually here, to continually pray. He means to continue to pray, continue to pray. In other words, to persevere in prayer or not to give up on prayer. Don't stop praying, is what he's saying. Keep, keep praying, because you need it. Because we are not going to be able to do what he just said, that is rejoice always, nor are we gonna be able to do what he's about to say, that is, that is to give thanks in all circumstances on our own steam. That ain't happening. That's not gonna happen, not a chance. And so we are going to need some help from above, right? And prayer, I know we're, we're taking a bit of a break here, but we're, we're on our series on prayer, but prayer, what is prayer at, a, at this most basic level? It's reaching out to God for help. It's calling out to God, right? Prayer is what Peter did when, we, when he sank into the depths, when he cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus reached out and, and lifted him up from, that, from what he was sinking. What is a picture of, you know, an, an immediate saving right there? Yeah, he, he didn't die in the water, but there's a bigger picture there, right? The resurrection, because we're all going to sink into that watery grave one day, and Jesus will be there to lift us up. But you see, apart from God, there is no reason to rejoice always. None. No reason to give thanks in all circumstances. Apart from God, sickness, sin, and death, they will have the last word. You know, we might encounter a circumstance or two here and there or more along the way that make us happy, if we're lucky. Some don't get that in life. But in the end, it will all of it be for naught. Sickness will have weakened us, sin will have corrupted us, and death will have taken us. The end. And so, Paul says, pray that we, that you, that all of us might not live apart from God. Right? Pray as if your life depended on it. Don't give up praying. Pray continually. And so then Paul goes on, he says, give thanks in all circumstances. Now, first read, I don't know about for you, but again, like what I was saying about the rejoice always, that just struck me as odd. But then I was reading someone who pointed out a good point. He said, notice he does not say give thanks for all circumstances. Right? He's not telling us to be thankful for circumstances of sickness and sin and death. That would make no sense. No, he is saying in all circumstances, in all of them, give thanks. Why? Well, this is where we get to, I, I, there's more to it than this, but this is part of it, I think. But this is where we get to the title of this sermon, because a thankful heart makes the anger, or you fill in the blank, the bitterness, or the resentment, or jealousy, or depression, or anxiety, 
Vamoosh, <laughs> you know, get out of here. I want to share an illustration here because I, um, pray for me while I'm sharing this because I don't, I don't know exactly how I was going to do it. But something happened this week that was really timely leading into this sermon. But so I have been struggling with bitterness and anger over a situation from my past that just every time I think about it and, and I start talking about it, it's like this dark pit that just pulls me in to this bitterness. And it came up again. I was talking with my wife, Heidi, and she had tears in her eyes. And I, I said to her afterwards, and she said, Jay, this is, this, this is going to do you in. Like, you've got to get over this. And the thing is, I was saying to her, I don't know how to do that. I know I have to, but I don't know how. I don't know where to begin. And so I, we had recovered together, my recovery group that night. And so I promised, I, you know what, I'm, I'm going to bring it up there. The, the only thing I can do is I'm just going to confess it and acknowledge it and leave it with God. And um, so I went, and I opened up about it. And um, someone in the group, we, we go around and we each share, someone in the group shared something that i just done that day. I, like uh, in preparation for this sermon, I was reading about the scientific evidence that supports what God says about being thankful. That shows, you know, in our neural pathways in our brain, you cannot be happy and angry at the same time. Impossible. The neural pathways, you, either one, pleasure's going down or anger's going down, but they both can't go down. So I read that, and then when I got to the group, uh, the person shared the exact same thing. But I'm a little dense. Uh, I, I, I just thought, oh, coincidence, that's cool. I, I should have thought, oh, God, are you trying to tell me something here? But then the, the, in answer to my prayer, but then the next morning I, I woke up and my first picture, as soon as I opened my eyes, in my mind's eye, I saw this like a highway, uh, like all these roads, you know, representing my, my neural pathways and all that. And every single one of them, there was a traffic jam of Thanksgiving. And, and anger and bitterness just had nowhere to go. You know, they're just all in, in a holding pattern. And, uh, and all of a sudden it dawned on me that that was the answer to my prayer. In this situation, I was only looking at the hurt, the, 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 the bad thing, that every time I would think about it, it would bring me down. But Jesus was saying that, but there's more there. Look, I wish I could share the story, but I can't because I don't want to betray people, but, but there was more there. And... Um, and I didn't see it because I was so blinded, right? And once I saw it, I was like, oh, that's something I can truly be thankful for. And it filled my heart with thanksgiving. And, and then there was something else there. There was something else there. And then pretty soon, like, there was just no more uh, rent for, for my anger. You can't be thankful and angry at the same time. Right? So focus on the things to be thankful for. Be thankful in all circumstances, Paul's saying. You, you see that? Rejoice always. Because there's always something there if you, if you look for it. So Paul said this very same thing elsewhere. This was the other text I was going to read from. But Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, he says, Do not be anxious. Right? There's that word. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, right? Every circumstance, by, uh, by prayer... So he's talking about prayer here, and with thanksgiving. So it's all there in that one, one, one sentence. Present your request to God. And then verse 8, he says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And that's basically what God was telling me to do. Look for those things that are true and noble and, and trustworthy and pure in, in this situation and think about those things. Let those things sink in. And then he says, whatever you've learned or received or heard from me, uh, put into practice. And then he tells us what will happen. And the, and the God of peace will be with you. And the God of peace will be with you because you can't have peace and anxiety at the same time. Right? Just as you can't be thankful and bitter at the same time. A peaceful heart makes the anxiety depart. That could be another title. Or a thankful heart makes the anger depart. But back to our text here, just to conclude. It says, rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances. And then he says, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. 
In other words, he's saying, this is why I made you. This, this, is, this, is, this is your purpose in life. This is your goal. This is his will for you, right? This, this will that he's left for you uh, to give you. And he says, do not quench the spirit, right? In other words, do, do not cut yourselves off from the good that God has for you. Don't settle for less. He says, Don't, do not treat prophecies uh, prophecy is a proclamation of God's word. So this is the, the teachings of scripture. Do not teach prophecies. That is, you know, the, yeah, the promises of God revealed through the prophets in his word. The words that reveal God's will for us. A will that Paul's saying will have you rejoicing always and giving thanks in all circumstances. So Paul says, don't treat that with contempt. Don't treat it with contempt. That is judging it and, and finding it useless, you know, found, found wanting, empty, without even having tried it, without even having tested it, right, to see if it's true. And that's why he goes on to say next, but he says, but test them, right? Try them out, test them all. Hold on to what is good and reject every kind of evil. Hold on to what is good and reject every kind of evil because you can't have it both ways, right? And, can't have both the good and the evil. You can't be thankful and bitter at the same time. One or the other, but never both. That is what um, God re reminded me to do that day, um, on Monday. See, I was holding on to the evil, and as a result was rejecting the good. I had it totally backwards. I, and God had to help me to flip it around. And then Paul finishes it off. He says, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And how is this possible? Well, he once again reminds us that we need to keep our focus on Jesus because that is where it's all going to come from. Not from us, not from each other. It comes from him. He says, the one who calls you is faithful. He will do it. Amen? Amen. Amen. We are going to close here. Um, we're going to pray, but we're, we usually do the Apostles' Creed here, but I wanted to take some time this morning and, and pray and invite you on this day of Thanksgiving to, to uh, ask God, we'll ask God together to bring to mind the things that, that are, are thankful for, and even in situations that often cause us to go down that rabbit hole of bitterness, even there. I invite you to bring that scenario into your mind and ask God, what, what is there here to be thankful for? Can we do that? Pray together, I'll invite you, and then we'll just have a time of silence and you go before God with your thanksgiving. Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we are oftentimes... Um, I am oftentimes, and I'm sure I'm not alone, just can be overwhelmed with anger and bitter and jealousy. And Father, that brings me to a bad place. Father, I pray that you would help each of us as we think of those areas in our lives or those people in those, our, our lives or those situations where, where uh, yes, we can be taken down. Help us each Lord to see you in that situation to see your provision in that situation to see the good that we may hold on to and in so doing reject the evil hear each of our prayers this morning we pray in your precious name Lord, we pray that you would help us not to lose sight. Father, that uh, as we sink into the, the depths, into the waves, into the sea, Lord, that in those moments we would remember you and call out to you, to call out for help. Father, we pray that you would help us uh, to do as you taught Paul, 
and so many others teach us as well that we might know the secret of contentment, of peace that is found in you in the midst of any and all circumstances. Father, we lift up uh, all those in our, in our congregation, those who are at home or online. Father, you know the many needs that are there that we continue to lift up and ask, Lord, that you would meet those needs. For the many things to rejoice over, Lord, that we would together as a family uh, give thanks. Father, we continue to keep them all in, in, in prayer. And Father, we together pray uh, in, in the words that you, Lord Jesus, taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. Now invite the deacons forward and, and uh, Samara and Autumn to lead a song of ministry as we take our offering.
Heavenly Father, on this time of thanksgiving, Lord, we give thanks for, the, for all that we have received, for all that we have and the opportunities where we have to give. Lord, to your, in your name and to your glory, this we pray. Amen. Amen. I hear once again those words from the Apostle Paul, that benediction that he gave at the end. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful. He will do it. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.